I'd like to welcome our second panel up to the stage. Come on up. Uh, they are going to be taking on the, the very uh, big challenge of, of addressing fundamental research. So all things research covered by four people. Um, needless to say, our ex exploration of the nanoscale has uncovered emerging properties and creative solutions. It's also produced a, a really vibrant research ecosystem that has attracted and trained an entire generation, and I'd include myself in, in, uh, in that. So the panel is going to be moderated by NSET co-chair Andy Schwartz from DOE, Department of Energy, and the task of covering all things nano uh, fall to Cheryl Kerfeld, who is the HANA Distinguished Professor of Structural Bioengineering in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Michigan State University, Evelyn Hu, the Tar Coin Professor of Applied Physics and of Electrical Engineering at Harvard University, and Denis Wurtz, the Theophilus Haley Smoot Professor in the Department of Chem Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering and Vice Provost for Research at Johns Hopkins. So thank you very much. How'd I do? <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. You saved me from having to pronounce all of that. And unlike Trey, we got a lot of smiles up there. So I guess this is this is this is the happy panel. So good morning, everyone. It's still morning, um, and I recognize we're standing now between you and lunch. So hopefully, we'll keep you engaged for the next forty-five minutes, uh, and then uh, turn you over to to lunch and and the posters and uh, informal networking. So. As Brandon said, my name is Andy Schwartz. Uh, I'm here, uh, my day job is uh, as the Division Director for Material Sciences and Engineering in the Office of Basic Energy Sciences at the Department of Energy. I also, as Brandon said, co-chair the NSET Nanoscale Science Engineering and Technology Interagency Committee that has coordinated um, everything NNI for many years, as, as, as Mike told us about this morning. So it's really an honor to be, have been invited to moderate this panel, a uh, very distinguished panel that we have here today on fundamental research. Um, while the NNI is, of course, about nanotechnology, uh, the reality is that all nanotechnology is really underpinned by deep foundational nanoscience. Um, in fact, just this morning, we heard uh, Senator Wyden uh, refer to nanotechnology as the science of everything small. So I think what we're going to try to do today is talk about that incredibly broad uh, and diverse um, nanoscience uh, portfolio that has been invested in for many years. Um, as Brandon said, we have three people on this panel. Uh, they, their, their careers uh, have spanned many decades in various fields of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Obviously, they can't be expected to cover everything nano, so we'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, I would welcome anyone in the audience here or online to submit questions to the panel uh, using the Slido uh, interface, um, and Quinn will help us to, uh, to field those questions. Um, I wanted to start, actually, by just giving each of the panelists a chance to introduce themselves rather than have me talk about them. Um, we have, as, as Brandon said, uh, Professor Evelyn Hu, Professor, Professor Cheryl Kerfeld, and Professor Denny Wirtz. Um, and I'd like to have them introduce themselves, talk about their scientific interests um, broadly, and also what makes nanoscience exciting uh, to them. So we're going to start with Evelyn in the middle. Thank you. Um, you can see that I'm uh, at Harvard in electrical engineering applied physics. My training is in physics. Um, I've been working in nanoscience, nanotechnology, probably since my first job out of graduate school at Bell Labs, where I was early engaged in trying to unleash the fascination and the power of the very small. Um, and since um, moving on there, developing some tools, I've concentrated mostly in semiconductor materials, superconducting materials, making electronic and photonic devices. And right now um, I've taken that to a level for um, using nano science and nanotechnology to look at new possible platforms for quantum information technologies. Thanks Evelyn. Uh, Cheryl, you wanna go next? Good morning. Uh, I'm at 
Michigan State University. That's my academic home where I'm in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and also in the MSU DOE Plant Research Lab. My uh, homes in Berkeley are the Molecular Biophysics and Integrated Bioimaging Division and also the Environmental Genomics and Systems Biology Division. And I tell you all that because the common denominator and the common nano theme there is structure, biological nanostructures that are involved in various processes. And some of the things that, I, um, that our work uh, relates to is applying sort of nano device building uh, from biological building blocks to problems and to applications in everything from plant biology to human health. Thanks, Cheryl. Denny? That's impressive. So um, uh, I'm merely a faculty at Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, and my background is also physics, although I, I met my match uh, when I did my postdoc uh, uh, in Paris uh, with someone very famous and decided that it was time you know, to, to go to the soft sciences and go to, into biology uh, accordingly. Uh, uh, but setting foot at Hopkins, uh, of course, prompted part of this, uh, and uh, uh, I uh, co-founded the Institute for Nanobiotechnology, recognizing already then that nanoscience, nanotechnology uh, could be not only useful uh, to develop tools to integrate cell behavior, and that's what a lot of my lab has done, but no, uh, more recently harness uh, that power uh, to engineer cells, uh, in particular uh, for immuno-oncological applications. Um, I'm also VP for research, and I get a chance to see how at Hopkins we have a vibrant community of chemists, physicists, uh, biologists, biomedical engineers, uh, and clinicians, uh, something I'll, I'll go back to uh, quite a bit, I'm sure, uh, later on, um, where as a team, we develop great application of science uh, into uh, the life sciences. Great, thank you all for those introductions. So we've prepared some questions here, um, but we're, as I said, happy to take questions from the audience as well. So I'm gonna start with sort of the big picture question about the NNI. That's what we're here to talk about today and to celebrate. Um, so how, how, has the, how has this national emphasis for, for two plus decades on nanotechnology through the NNI impacted your work uh, and how have you engaged with the broader NNI community? Um, Evelyn, do you wanna start? Thank you, Andy. Um, I wanted to intimate that I've been nano since birth, um, but <laughs> hopefully conquered that um, size limitation. How has it impacted my work? Um, I think um, something that I profoundly believed in and um, tried to help make happen um, has proliferated with national investments and with the help of the NNI to create broader infrastructure um, across the country and globally to bring in um, the interest of a, a far larger segment of um, diverse um, interests and disciplines. And how that's affected me is to provide me with more tools, with more collaborators, with more ideas, with more agency to pursue um, the areas that were important to me. Um, so developing the tools, using those tools to reach out to um, people in different disciplines, those in the biological disciplines, um, biochemical disciplines, um, mechanical disciplines, and now into um, looking forward into uh, possible applications for quantum information science. Thanks, Evelyn. Cheryl? Yeah, I think possibly in contrast to Evelyn, I'm adult onset uh, nano. <laughs> and, uh, this, I think, possibly reflects that it maybe came a little bit later to the biological sciences, for example. And so I was trained as a crystallographer, as a protein uh, structural biologist. And I would say that it's only within the last decade, to 15 years or so, that we've realized that we now have the power, the capacity. We, we can see things well enough, and we also have some of the infrastructure, the technologies that have developed that allow us to try to to try to control what we uh, see in terms of these, uh, the sorts of nano devices and nanostructures that I work on. So for me, I would say a lot of my engagement with the broader nanotechnology field is looking at what's being done with say, single wall carbon nanotubes or other types of um, buckyballs and different sorts of things and how then we can take, uh, take plays out of those playbooks 
uh, with our biologically based protein based structures. And so for one example of that is there's something called phyto nanotechnology, which is of course bringing in uh, nanoparticles into plants and so on for various reasons. I think it was mentioned this morning. So we are actively looking at a biologically based type of nanoparticle then that could be used for the same, the same thing. So those sorts of we've taken we've uh, I guess my answer is then that we've mainly used this as as uh, uh, inspiration uh, to try to build things out of biological parts. Thanks, Denny. I think very complementary uh, to what you just heard, uh, and from uh, Evelyn as well, uh, is uh, engagement with a larger nanoscale science community has been in the training of students and postdocs. Uh, we received one of the very early um, HHMI um, training grants. They don't do this uh, program anymore, unfortunately, but uh, where we proposed then what was um, uh, very forward-looking in uh, bringing chemists, physicists, and biologists at the time, I know it's clinician as well, um, to develop uh, new nano tools um, with a name uh, to understand better biology. Uh, we uh, that program was really a, a, a really launching pad into uh, getting uh, training grants in, from the National Cancer Institute, uh, which quite early on recognized indeed uh, the power of not only of nanotechnologies but simply in general of bringing people from uh, outside of you know more mainstream molecular biology, cell biology uh, communities, and again from physics and chemistry, and, and the entry into that was really nanotechnology. Uh, and, and I've had, um, I've been a PI on a TDD2, it's a, it's a, a training grant mechanism at the NCI uh, to support students who are all, and postdocs who are all co-advised by one chemist physicist or nanotechnologist in general and one uh, biologist or uh, uh, clinicians. And we always say two champions rooting for your success during your PhD and beyond, and ensuring uh, that they can attend a nanotech conference and, and, and not you know, be shamed and be absolutely cutting edge in the physics and chemistry, but then uh, attend a AACR meeting, for instance, American Association for Cancer Research, and having that co-advising by a clinician, ensuring that they didn't ask a question that no oncologist would have asked, right? Sorry to say, but academic engineers have a tendency to ask the wrong question in biology. Um, again, with that co-advising, ensuring that they'd be uh, absolutely legit on both sides. So that's been, uh, by and large, our largest uh, and most meaningful uh, connection with that, that uh, NNI community. Great, uh, thank you, Denis. And actually, that's that's a great segue into where I was going to go next. Um, and and what we're going to see, I think, throughout the day today is the is the cross connections across these panels and the various speakers. Right, we're really an incredibly well organized agenda from our our colleagues at NNCO, and you know, sort of targeting the different aspects of the NNI. But in fact, they're all they're all weaved together. So this idea uh, of um, of cross disciplinary training um, is really an important one. And in fact, I really appreciated the one of the final remarks by Professor Wetmore from the last panel about you know going beyond just jargon and language and how do we actually build community and connection. So I building on what Denis just said, I, I'd like to ask you about how do you balance this um, the importance to develop deep knowledge in, in specific scientific and technical disciplines um, with this cross-disciplinary training um, and research and excuse me, in nanotechnology that's cross-disciplinary? Um, and do you have specific examples from your experience or what you've seen around you of, of, of things that work, approaches or, or projects that work um, uh, or ones that don't, that might be a, a learning experience for the audience? So Cheryl, do you wanna, do you wanna start with that? Sure, uh, I've been involved in a couple of projects that have spanned uh, groups of physicists all the way uh, up to chemical engineers and, and then the biologists in, in between, synthetic chemists and so on. And as I think was touched on in the last panel, uh, there is definitely a need for a common sort of architectural vocabulary. Again, to uh, the kinds of things that we're doing is we're trying to build nano devices in cells or synthetic cells with, with biological building blocks. And so the common lexicon is, is fundamentally important. The other thing that I've, I guess I've learned that's helped me maybe anticipate where we have some issues 
is that every discipline, you know, brings a certain level of focus or resolution where they allied some detail and focus on others that I might not be, you know, say, you know, curious about the properties of phosphate like like someone else would be as and uh, in looking at an overall system. So I think beginning to understand where where your colleagues are are coming from. And having, again, and I think this was also touched on the last panel, the sorts of um, trust building sorts of things in these larger collaborative groups that I've been involved with, for example, by DOE or by NSF and so on, to try to uh, sort of lay that foundation of respect. And so that when you do find these sort of shortfalls uh, in, in each other's areas of emphasis or degree of resolution that they're looking at some aspect of, that that can be, uh, can be addressed in a, in a sort of a cheerful, non-threatening way, super important for the trainees so that they don't, you know, um, shut down in, in these kinds of situations. It's maybe kind of a soft answer, but that's, you know, at, at sort of the interpersonal thing that's, I think, really important. Thanks. Uh, Evelyn? Thank you, um, and and thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'll give a soft answer as well, but I, I first want to say, Andy, the way you frame the question, it's almost like an either or. Um, how do you balance providing a broad interdisciplinary approach with beginning to dig down and understand something in depth? And I don't want to diminish the problems. You've heard of some of the challenges before, jargon, particular points of view, a, a particular um, uh, particular approaches and beliefs in in different areas, but I do want to say it's not an either or. It's it's a it's a both end, um, and I firmly believe that by looking at broader expertise, by exposing our students to a broader range of possibilities and tools, that it can only help them dig deeper into whatever it is that they want to pursue. Um, and uh, part of that answer, um, I, I don't want to diminish the issues because there have been numerous times through nanotechnology and now through actually in the quantum domain, bringing in computer scientists with physicists and electrical engineers and, and, um, and uh, biologists and chemists, um, talking about different approaches um, to the world. It isn't easy. Um, it, uh, it does require work, but I'll suggest two things. One thing is um, to work with the new generation because it's by bringing the new generation into the environments and the training, they're the ones who are gonna get it. They're the ones who are gonna be able to adopt the new technologies easily in their portfolio of um, addressing the world much more easily than I can or my colleagues can. The other thing is, and if NSF is loath to endorse alcohol as part of their um, proposal platform, I would suggest that the thing that brings together people is common infrastructure, whatever the common infrastructure is. So we, my group uses clean rooms, the kinds of clean rooms sort of that Intel uses, but it's not just for electrical engineers or physicists or people in the hard sciences, Clean rooms have been embraced by those working in squishy technologies, biologists, soft matter people. And it's um, students or people working in clean rooms, sometimes six hours at a time and um, talking to each other. Those are where ideas are generated. So the investment in common infrastructure that brings people together with different points of view and different projects and having them, you know, at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning want someone to speak to or someone to advise them on why a piece of in, in instrumentation isn't working, um, that, I think, uh, enables the freer flow of ideas as well. Great. Thank you, Evelyn. And, and, I, and I agree with your comment. Thanks on the, on the not, not making it either or. So appreciate um, that. Go ahead, Denise. So I don't know if my answer is going to be a, a soft answer, um, but I've actually struggled uh, with with that question for a very long time, and I can't say that I've found really a solution. That is, um, on one hand, uh, as a, as a scientist, you want, and I think you need to be deeply trained in in one discipline, say chemistry or, or physics or math, 
before moving into an interdisciplinary field like nanotech. Um, and uh, having said that, if you do math all day, maybe the excitement about science may, may diminish because you're not seeing the excitement of, for instance, nanotech can bring about. Um, and so hence the struggle. And, and maybe there's a bit of a timing that is maybe at the undergraduate level, you'd be very deeply trained in, in chemistry, biology, physics, math, right? Um, uh, doing it a bit too early, meaning doing nanotech too early, I think would uh, uh, jeopardize your ability to really to learn the, the hard stuff uh, that sometimes you have to, um, as a way to contribute to the nanotech field later on. And then at the graduate, maybe even the postdoc level, um, do this more interdisciplinary stuff. Uh, some, like math is an example discipline, may take even longer than just an undergraduate degree in math, right? Um, again, having said that, if, if you have to have that excitement of, of seeing uh, potential exciting applications seen in the life sciences um, as a way to motivate yourself to, to, to learn maybe the hard stuff. Um, so uh, maybe the, it's a question of, of timing and this timing could be different for different people and people coming from into a different field in, into uh, the nanoscience field. And so I can't say I've solved this. I, I can't say that, I, but <laughs> all three of us, right? Um, did come from uh, singular disciplines uh, where we all deeply trained and then moved into NASA and science. So dispensing advice and say, go into the multidisciplinary field, um, maybe uh, having then trained yourself in one of those important contributory disciplines into NASA yeah. science is, is one way to look at it. No, that's right. And, and I know there's evolution in academia, but we still do have strongly the, 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 the traditional disciplines and departments still exist. Um, and, and maybe for good reason. And actually, I have a follow-up question for any one of you that wants to try to answer this that I just came to mind. If you look back, let's say 10 or 15 years in your career, do you see a difference in the students entering, like either, well, take either undergraduate or graduate level in their interests in the, I mean, do they come in saying, I want to do multidisciplinary or do they come in more so than they used to? Has that changed? Is that evolved? No, to totally. We, we were simply meeting uh, uh, a, a market demand uh, when mm -hmm. we, uh, ask uh, each student in our training programs to be co-advised was simply um, having heard for, for too long my students coming to me and say, maybe I want to work with you, but only if you also work with this neuroscientist or mm -hmm. this uh, neuro, uh, you know, uh, immunologist and uh, inspired by their own uh, creative ways to, to think about their own PhDs, I said, it's time maybe to to, add, to do this at scale for those who may not think about this, you know, this, this possibilities um, uh, and uh, keeping the excitement again, keeping also the legitimacy and the, and the depth uh, uh, of the two aspects when you, you again co-advise, right? Again, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you want to be able to present a, a talk uh, that is strong in the, the, the tech, the physics, the chemistry, but also in the application states, energy, uh, environmental, or in my case, life science. Mm -hmm. um, the immunology has to be superb, and even more than that, has to contribute something uh, really new, for example. Mm -hmm. If I could add a few words, um, two things. One is um, definitely our students want um, that interdisciplinary approach. And I think for all of us, but uh, these students now coming in, I see at the undergraduate also, as well as the graduate level, they're much more sophisticated than I was ever. They come in with already having pursued research experiences and the research experiences they've pursued can be quite broad. And so they come in and maybe all of you who are scientists and engineers remember, remember you know, what it first attracted you to science, which was everything and, and solving the mysteries of the world and how you felt that you had to begin to narrow your focus of um, regard and um, influence, just naming a major in the undergraduate level and then in graduate school having to pick a subject. And I see that our students don't want to do that. Even at the undergraduate level, they mourn the parts of themselves that they value that they think they're going to have to give up if they're going to contribute in a meaningful way. So I think 
Number one, definitely, I think they're, they're, our students are more aware, they're more demanding, they're more, um, they better wish to have a large influence on the world. And I just want to say another thing about deep disciplines and um, disciplines like nanotechnology or multidisciplinary aspects. Um, disciplines evolve. Electrical engineering evolved out of physics. Computer science evolved out of math. Um, I'm not saying that nanotechnology and not everything that embraces many disciplines deserves to pop up and become its own discipline, but the, the very freshness and vitality of science and engineering is that it can evolve to embrace new knowledge, new techniques um, that we give names to, and so it's entirely fitting and, and it's really very important that we take cognizance of interdisciplinary opportunities and facilities and techniques. Thanks. Cheryl, do you want to add anything? Okay. Really, I can't add, add too much. The only thing I would say is, yes, that proliferation of programs that allow a student a rather broad range of experience on the way to their PhD is, is really the, the attractive thing right now, and for good reason. And it's actually much as you say, rather than the way that we had to specialize, mm -hmm. to be able to, to maintain that is, I think, something that's really wonderful about the education right now that, that one gets, so. Great, okay. I'm looking to Quinn to see if we have any online questions. If not, I'll continue. We can kind of jump ahead. I think this will inform the next question you might okay. be planning to ask your panel, but this was um, from the audience. What advice do you have for young nanoscientists applying for faculty positions? They're curious, what research areas do you think are up and coming? There's a lot of questions actually in how nano is informing QIS right now and, and sort of how it's moving in some areas to more of a foundational and supporting the new emerging fields. And so what are your thoughts on, on areas to ironically focus on after all these recent comments for young faculty? Any of you? My, my advice is be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, I, I think it, it, it drives everything. Um, and it, if you started off doing a PhD or postdoc in, in nanoscience, sure, you want to be pragmatic on one hand and, and need to pursue that for, to some extent, but quickly branch off. It can still be part of nano, but just go crazy. I, I was doing renormalization group calculations, theor theoretical physics to the most theoretical possible way. And, I, and now I'm doing, you know, cancer research, right? So uh, I don't do any, any, I set foot at, at Hopkins and I did experimental biology. I didn't know what DNA stood for. I, I knew nothing, but I intuitively believe they could do biology. So all of this to say, you know, maybe don't follow my, what I'm doing, uh, but be passionate about what you're doing. And uh, uh, I love what I don't know. And I, I learn about it by doing it. Uh, I rarely open textbooks because most likely half of, what's there, especially in life sciences, either wrong or incomplete, so. I agree with Denis uh, that it's important if you're undertaking a career and you're applying for a faculty position or any position, that you're passionate and you believe in, in what you've done. And so this, what we talked about um, most recently is the breadth of interdisciplinary information versus depth. And I and I, again, I don't think it has to be either or, but whatever you've done, be able, you know, you've taken a technique from any number of different areas and you applied it, believe in what's important about what you've done, understand the value of what you've done and present that. Um, whatever area that, that um, you think you define, even if the area that you've um, worked on is something that you've defined yourself. And actually like Denis, uh, uh, my, my um, physics background, I did an accelerator experiment. Um, and I knew then that that, for various reasons, sociological as well as scientific, that that was not the promising area for me. So I changed dramatically and it required learning all kinds of concepts on, on the job that I had never been introduced to. And actually it put you at a disadvantage, but it was a lot of fun. And I think in the end, it makes you the richer for it. Thank you. 
I do have something to add. It's a lot more mundane uh, and uh, and just some practical advice that I think I've found with the kind of work that we do. So typically, um, search committees are looking at their prospects for what kind of funding that they can attract, what kind of impact that they can have uh, for the for the department, for the university. And one thing that's really wonderful about nanobiotechnology, uh, the sorts of things that we do, is I can separate uh, my group's work or our, our work into practical sort of applications, future nanomedicine applications, these kinds of things. But I can also pose it as a way to learn fundamental principles of biology. So the uh, so and I, the way that I like to pitch it is rather than the sort of reductionist approach that I was trained on, where you studied an individual enzyme for its activity and crystallize it and learn the structure, we're using a constructionist approach. So trying to build things that we think you know that that mimic what we see in biological systems, and then do they work? Do they work that way? So that way I'm able to tap into funding streams. Uh, I just have to be really honest about this that allow me to, to pose my work as you know fundamental you know biology principles. And then I can also go to the to the applications, to the trying to pitch that I'm building a device that will deliver a therapeutic to a plant or to a uh, you know to a human being, that sort of thing. So that's, I think, one of the really beautiful things about nano in from my perspective is is the ability to 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 do good work and to do important work in in two you know very different sort of schools of schools of thoughts or two different goals. I, I love what Cheryl is saying because in a way it it is a combination uh, that turned into a bit of a pipeline, right? is mm -hmm. is is the fundamental doing application and then back to fundamental application. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, <laughs> If you can think of it that way as you st start your, your career, um, um, maybe some of you are thinking, I don't have that position yet. I'm trying to apply to a position. So apply to Hopkins, we have 200 applications, the 200 positions. So think about Hopkins for faculty position, by the way, a little plug. Um, but I like what, what you're saying in terms of in your own lab, combining uh, the fundamentals, always driving new ideas, really fundamentally new, new directions. And think of the the application as well. It, it's a little bit easier, I think, in the life science maybe. Um, so it broadens your reach and your potential. Great, thank you all. It was very insightful. Um, and thanks for the question, wherever it came from. Um, I wanted to turn to something actually that, that already was sort of alluded to. I think um, Evelyn alluded to it, which is this sharing of, of tools and capabilities. And actually we saw, I think some of it this morning in Chad Merkin's talk where he, he is showing us how they took an AFM, you know, a, a tool designed for imaging, and turned it into a synthesis tool, right? So I'd be curious to hear from each of you um, examples uh, from your work or the, the the work you've seen around you of those kind of success stories where capabilities, tools, um, approaches developed in one field um, have crossed over and had an impact in another field. Um, uh, Evelyn, do you want to start? You brought it up earlier. Um, where to begin? I mean, I think it's rife, um, and maybe Mike will remember this, Mike Rocco, um, at the early days of the um, planning for the National Nanotechnology Initiative, you know, there was a lot of talk about why now, why this moment in time, why with all the, um, the um, fundamental work done in many fields, why is it now? And one of the icons, the early icons were scanning probe tools. Don Eigler's um, uh, photo of, of atoms placed on a copper grid. Um, and, and Chad brought it up again, um, scanning probe tool. Um, so, uh, you know, almost every instrument that I work with um, when it's in the clean room, scanning probe tools that have developed the capability to not only push and probe an image, not only dip pen lithography, not only um, that that has blossomed under Chad Merkin's guidance, but um, magnetic sensors, force sensors, learning um, what we can do with actually single atoms or group of atoms um, at the nanoscale. And I would say, although the manifestation is different, some of my colleagues now at Harvard have um, made impressive arrays of 100 um, cold atoms um, that will do quantum simulations. They're held together not by scanning probe tools, 
but it's the same idea. Can you make an array? Can you move single atoms? Can you move molecules? Can you put them in position? Can you put them in an engineered environment that nature would not have thought to place them in? And so I go back to the scanning probe tool. I go back to the manifestations of all the ways that we um, try to sculpt materials at the nano meso scale, um, how we try to impose patterns on them. Um, and, and I would say that there are, and you, one of the other poster children for nano, you heard it this morning in the discussions, are nature's natural nanostructures like graphene, like nanotubes, and those themselves, because they have that natural structure, have been used as tools or um, leverage um, next generation innovation. Cheryl? Uh, just to sort of add another dimension to the idea of tools, uh, in, in my area, the uh, cryo-electron microscopy, these kinds of visualization tools that are allowing us to see uh, that next level, that next, the MISA scale organization that we're able to build up from our nano devices in, in our case, I think has been really important. And then uh, sort of uh, don't exactly know how to classify this, but right now liquid liquid phase separation. So something that's very become really uh, important to the chemists and so on is we've sort of entered into working, uh, you know, taking what's hot in that field and, and adding it to what we're doing right now. And we're seeing some, much like Professor Merkin showed this morning, when you combine DNA with nanoparticles, suddenly you got this hairy nano uh, particle that you'd never see in nature, new to nature sort of structure. And this sort of same kind of thing. So in some, I'd say, yes, there's technologies definitely for imaging. And then there's also that embracing what's, what's coming down the pipe in a sister discipline. Uh, and seeing where where there could be some really interesting things if you bring this together. Denis? I'm, I'm thinking of two, two examples. The, the first one, um, uh, nanoreology, that uh, uh, where we uh, wanted to measure the micromechanical properties of cells. The, the volume of a cell is femtoliter, right? So there's, there's no rheometer you could use to measure somehow uh, uh, the, the spatially resolved mechanical properties of this cytoplasm or, or, or nucleoplasm. And we, we thought initially of using, uh, you know, simply Newton's law, right? And you can write an equation, uh, but along the way, learn uh, that these beads could undergo active motions and really had to rewrite uh, Newton's law to take into account uh, motor protein driven active motion of these beads. Really, um, the full circle from using all very ancient physics to, to learn biology, but then rewriting the book in, in, in physics as well. Um, the, the second example is uh, much more recent, where we are, uh, um, but very inspired by my early background in phase transitions, where um, uh, density is a, it's called an order parameter in soft condensed matter physics. Uh, the last parameter you'd ever manipulate in biology, right? You don't change the density of cell to learn anything, but we went ahead and did that anyway. And if you change the density of immune cells in a 3D uh, collagen matrix, they're going to change the velocity and then use uh, so, so some sort of uh, phase transition in reverse. The closer they are, the faster they go. It's sort of the closer they are, the more crystalline they may become. It's the opposite but found out the way they do this and then exploded it to make immune cells much more infiltrating, uh, penetrative, invasive into solid tumors. So again, a basic physic concept exploited to know, uh, to uh, manipulate immune cell behavior to address a very, you know, clinically important question in, in infiltrating solid tumors like pancreatic cancer, but the nano comes in synthesizing new receptors to do so. So we found out the little ligands were being secreted by the immune cells that they got, got close to one another. And so we wanted to lock in that high motility state and came up with a, a, a huge library of little molecules that then can lock in this high motility state. So uh, it's multidisciplinary, right? We had to, again, the only immunology I know is the one I, I did with, with that project. But um, you know, pushing the boundaries and, and because of this culture that came from the nano uh, community of, 
of never hesitating to bring in kind of new perspective. Um, so my students were able to be co-advised properly by you know uh, people actually in human immunology and new cancer and on and on. But uh, um, I think these are two examples of repurposing of nano uh, for, in this case, life science implications. Great, thank, thank you all for those insights. And actually, I think that's a great uh, uh, preview for the, you know, we'll have an infrastructure panel this afternoon. So the tools and more broadly, the infrastructure for, for nanoscience and nanotechnology have been part of this initiative since, as Mike knows, the earliest days at, at you know, supported by multiple agencies, supported by the NSF, by DOE, certainly by the, the defense agencies, uh, NIH, and and others. Um, and in fact, we we stand here in the in the National Academies. We National Academy has been charged just recently to do their quadrennial review of the NNI, uh, which they're just starting. And and in fact, the focus is on on in particularly the infrastructure and the capabilities and accessibility. How we make sure that those capabilities are available to the broad science, uh, engineering, technology, research communities. Um, so that'll be be interesting to watch that. Okay, we're coming up on nearly the end of time and, and the lunch hour. Um, so maybe I'll just um, maybe I'll just conclude by kind of asking you guys what excites you. I think you know we're gonna we're gonna hear a, a keynote panel this afternoon about the future of the NNI or future of nanotechnology. Um, but I'd really like to hear from each of you in your fields or what you see around you, your institutions and, and others. Um, What's the exciting new directions or current directions that you see uh, going forward? I, I, you know, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but really just uh, where do you where do you get excited? So let's start at the end with Cheryl. Okay, I guess uh, the continued ability to repurpose biological materials. Uh, I think there's a, certainly a need for another type of foundational set of building blocks that's something that's biodegradable, biocompatible, and so on. So I think there's a real possibility there. And then the confluence with some of the things that are also happening with computing, AI, uh, machine learning, and so on, even, you know, the now the ability to sort of, um, you know, pursue non-equilibrium thermodynamics at the level of the kind of thing that we're working at in nano is, is really exciting for those of us in the sort of biological based realm. Thanks. Uh, Evelyn? Uh, there's so much, uh, I'll just try and, and be brief. Um, I think um, the increasing um, uh, miniaturization of extremely powerful photonic, phononic, um, micromechanical, um, electrical sensors and circuits that can be um, implanted within um, structures. That's sort of the pragmatic and practical aspect that give rise to new technologies, including in cognizance in, in conjunction with biological technologies for me. So Cheryl talked about the fundamental and um, the translational, the useful and the deeply profound questions. For me at the nanoscale, I currently work with defects in, in crystals, disordered, things that people reject, and yet they have in, in incredible combinations of spin and photon information that are now being considered as a basis for qubits. So understanding where we see defects or disorder materials and how to, why, and how to use that to make um, structures and, and systems better. Thank you. Uh, Denis? What I'm going to talk about is a lot less inspiring than what Evelyn and Cheryl talked about is, I'm afraid, what's in front of me. Um, uh, having said this, uh, you heard in the last panel, uh, you know, dating back in the, the early 2000s, uh, a, a public uh, a concern that nanotechnology would run a vogue, that it would create all kinds of uh, health hazards, for instance. Um, uh, really, uh, these notions should be uh, converted from a fear and concern into using uh, what all of this converge to is immunology and and uh, engineers is is a, don't learn immunology they, they, but they should all drug and gene delivery vehicles uh, should really uh, do affect will eventually affect when applied to patients um, immunological responses instead of kind of waiting for 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 that to address it instead it should be exploited um, we're doing some of this ourselves that I think exploding nanotechnology as a way to not simply deliver, but rewire, uh, hijack immune, immune system is, could be a great future. 
Um, so I'm going to stop here because it, it's time. It's like but, right on time. Uh, that was amazing. So uh, <laughs> yes. Love thank thank you all. Um, I, I'm just going to take my prerogative standing here at the microphone to, um, first of all, I will thank the, the three of the panelists because that was a really inspiring discussion and I really appreciate you taking the time. I also want to um, put on my NSAID hat, as I, as I mentioned at the outset and Brandon mentioned, I have for the last few years um, co-chaired along with uh, Brandon and uh, Auntie Makinen um, from ONR, the NSET um, Interagency Committee. And as was mentioned earlier, but for those of you who don't know, this is a 20 plus agency, very vibrant, very active community. Many of them are here in the room today um, that coordinates uh, everything related to the NNI and has for many years. And, and I think the committee itself um, uh, is um, can take a lot of credit for a lot of this success. But Behind that committee is a staffed office called the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. And events like this in particular and lots of the other things that happen uh, don't happen without that office. It's the office that uh, that Brandon and Quinn lead, um, but the rest of the staff are all here. And I know they've been working incredibly hard uh, for many months to get ready for this day. And I just wanna make sure we also acknowledge them right now. So please let's acknowledge this, this panel as well. Yeah. Yeah.